space here. I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds as people roll in and get comfortable. Yeah, one more. All right, I think we're gonna get started. Hello everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Heidi and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator at Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us and tuning into this virtual format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I have the pleasure of hosting our event this afternoon and I am delighted to welcome our guests, Amy Timberlake and John Clausen. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. You can click the link that we will drop into the chat box to get your own copy of Skunk and Badger, Egg Marks the Spot, and the other books by our authors. We do have some signed book plates that are amazing. So if you want to jump on that, we have um, limited supplies of those. So it'd be a wonderful addition to your book. Um, when, um, if you have a question, um, then you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. If you're joining us from school, please add your first name, your grade level, and the school name to your question so we can give you a big shout out. And just a quick reminder that the chat box has been disabled. Please only use the Q&A section for questions for our authors. At the end of the presentation, our guests will have time to answer some of your questions and you can upload the questions you like and want most answered. Now on to the event you're waiting for. Amy Timberlake has received a Newbery Honor, an Edgar Award, a Golden Kite Award, and the China Times Best Book Award for her novels for young readers. She's the author of One Came Home, as well as the middle grade novel, That Girl Lucy Moon, and the picture book, The Dirty Cowboy. She grew up in a small town in Wisconsin and now lives in Chicago. And Amy is the author of Skunk and Badger. John Clausen is a Canadian born author illustrator. His works such as I Want My Hat Back, This Is Not My Hat, and We Found a Hat have received a Caldecott Medal, two Caldecott Honors, and other international awards. He is a member of the Order of Canada in recognition of his influence on children's literature. He currently lives in Los Angeles with his wife and sons, and John is the illustrator of Skunk and Badger. So I'm gonna end things there and I'm gonna turn things over to you. I will see you all on the other end for Q&A. Hi. Thank you for having us. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce these books and then John and I will start talking. Um, so there are two books. There's Skunk and Badger and Egg Marks the Spot. And OK, the first story is Skunk and Badger. And it's the story of a badger who does important rock work. And let me just show you what that looks like. <laughs> Here is Badger doing important rock work. He does this work every day. He's very diligent. He's focused when he, you know, when he walks home from the grocery store, he thinks, oh, I must focus, 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 focus on my rock work. So he gets back home, he gets into his little room and he, and he starts doing his rock work. But then one day there is a knock at the door. Rap, 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 rap. And it is this skunk and skunk is an unexpected roommate and unexpected roommates hardly ever go well in fact i would probably say they never go well um, so you can just imagine if you had someone move into your room <laughs> unexpectedly it would be very difficult and these two characters are extremely different and so it's very hard to get them together in fact, I, I did literally wonder at, at a point, you know, during much of the writing of the first book, if they would get together. And <laughs> I, I just thought, well, I'm not gonna have a book if that happens, but that's part of the, that's part of the tension is not knowing exactly, but no spoiler, they do get together because there is book two. And I'm going to read a short section from the first book from that sort of was the link to the second book. And in this scene, Badger is showing Skunk his geological survey maps and geological, geologic, I think it's geological, geological survey maps are, um, the rocks under the landscape. So they're really interesting to look at. They, they're sort of really awfully colored. I don't know why geologists use the crazy colors that they do, but anyway, they're weirdly colored, but they show you the rocks underneath the landscape. So that's what Badger is showing, skunk. Badger 
told Skunk how he used maps on rock finding expeditions. Skunk gasped. Rock finding expedition? What is that? Badger explained about how he camped out. Under the stars, interrupted Skunk. Technically, yes, but. With a picnic every day, interrupted Skunk again. I guess I do eat outside. Skunk hopped from one foot to the other. What else? What else? So Badger explained how clues in the landscape led to a particular rock. Skunk slapped his paw on the map, like X marks the spot? Sort of, yes. Then Skunk turned and said, Badger, what are we waiting for? So they don't have to wait very long because guess what? Egg marks the spot. The egg in the title is a clue to you that it's not quite X marks the spot. So something else happens, but I'm not going to tell you exactly what that is. I think you should just read the book from beginning to end. And I also just don't think you should even read the dust jacket. Like, don't read anything. Just start at the beginning, go to the end, and kind of go for the ride, because that's, that's the fun of reading these kind of books. Anyway, egg marks the spot. Badger is going on this rock-finding expedition to find an agate. He has lost his spider eye agate, and uh, his cousin Fisher has taken it years ago. And he, it is his letter A agate for his wall of rocks. It is missing, and he, he's going to find one of those. And Skunk wants to go on this expedition partly because he's got this hedgehog that's taking his book review. And instead of having a conversation with the hedgehog, he's just going to escape and get out of there before Sunday comes around. And he has to go through another Sunday without his book review. Ah, so awful. So anyway, so he just heads out. So Badger and Skunk heads out and they go on this camping rock finding expedition. And once there, things do not go as planned, of course. And there are betray all right, betrayals, secrets, lies, and you should just read the book and find out what happens next. So. That is the introduction to the two books. <laughs> Take it away, John. What do you want to talk about? Uh, we, <laughs> I think that was pretty good. I'm not sure what else I have left to talk about. Um, we can talk about the drawing though a little bit if we want to. Okay, that would um, be great. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I did the drawings for this book and how that works is that, uh, well, sometimes I think Amy, I will get sort of ideas from Amy before the book is done, right? You'll send me like, you know, things like they camp in this book or there's gonna be this in this book. And so I can get ready and think about those things without having the story all the way done. And so you can think about a book cover. If you, I think that happened with this one, right? Where you're like, they're going camping and there's gonna be forests and lakes and things like that. And you knew more of the story than that, but just to get me ready to sort of start thinking about that stuff. Yeah, um, I think I, I said- I think I said it's going to be outside and there's yeah. trees. <laughs> right. And John, I think you're going to love the trees. I just, anyway, right. you do. I like your trees. I like <laughs> drawing insides of houses. And so the first book was fun, but I also really like drawing trees. And so I was very excited for the trees in this one. Um, and then, so when the book is finished, finished, when Amy has it finished anyway, then she sends it to me and I will start to pick out pieces in the book that I want to draw. And so I'll read through the book and say, oh, this scene would be really fun to draw, or we should probably get a picture of this so that they can see what that might look like or something like that. And then I'll do a bunch of, a, a whole list of just words like that to be like, this page, I want to draw this, and this page, I want to draw this. And it's usually a lot more things I want to draw than we have room for or time to draw. And so then we have to go and pick the ones that we're for sure going to do. And then I will draw those things. And that's what goes in the book. Um, and I also do the covers of the books. So I do the drawings for um, the jacket and sometimes usually the lettering and stuff. And so I can show you sort of how this goes if you want. I can, I can share my screen and we can look at this a little bit. Um, I will yeah. share my screen right now. Um, oh, one second. Okay, we can go to that. That's okay. Okay, Ooh. so that is a painting by a Canadian painter named Tom Thompson. Um, he's one of my favorite guys. He's, it's a long time ago but he would go out to the lakes and paint and he would canoe around and just had the craziest life painting out there in the middle of nowhere. But this painting was one of my favorites by him. It's very small in person. It's only like that big. Um, but as soon as I heard that there were tents and stuff, 
I thought of this painting and we basic, I basically copied it for the back cover of this book. You'll recognize. <laughs> if you go see it, we can go to, hold on, I'll go and find it. Um, well, this is the rough. Let's go to the final and take a look. So there it is, way in the back. If we zoom in and go over, is, is the tent on your screen, Amy? Are you seeing the tent? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So there's yes, our yes. Tom Thompson tent right there. I took the colors down a little bit because I'm not as brave as Tom is with colors, but that's his tent. That's uh, that's also Badger's tent. It is Badger that sleeps in the tent, right? I think. Yeah. Um, and so this cover, these, this kind of artwork, we start with, um, it doesn't go to this right away. The first thing we want to see is a rough of this. And so this was the rough of this. I did it all on the computer when we do a rough because it's easy to change. The final isn't done in the computer mostly, but the rough is done with the computer. And that's the drawing here. And it's pretty close. You know, some of the, the, the lines are a little rougher. Um, but everybody is sort of where they ought to be. And, um, and then you put, you know, this guy was, or the, the, our, our guy in the middle on the spine isn't quite figured out. He's still kind of rough. I think he was added near the end. And so he looks a little bit like that. But a lot of the stuff is, is, pretty, is pretty well there. And um, I think we had initially, we had a pickaxe and a shovel next to the names or next to the title to try and get something new in. But then when we, when we finished it, we thought, oh no, let's go back to the other things we had in the first cover just to tie it all together. And so after this is approved, after everybody likes this, then I have to do the final. And what the final looks like at first is like this, where this drawing is done on a piece of illustration board, which is sort of like really heavy paper. It doesn't bend or, or anything because I do this with a, with a dip pen and a dip pen can get really wet and kind of, and if you put too much water on a piece of paper, it gets crumply. And so I try and use something really heavy, like almost a piece of cardboard to draw on. But all of these lines were done with a dip pen. You dip in a little inkwell and you scratch your pen on the, on the piece of cardboard. And so you get a nice little scratchy line with it. It's hard, to, it's hard to get that with any other kind of tool. But what happens is you can see, sometimes you move your hand and a little bit of ink gets smudged <laughs> or there's just little accidents that happen that I usually really like. You can see it over there too, where just a bit of ink gets smudged and I have to go in there and clean that up afterwards. But you just get a really nice, sometimes the ink kind of bleeds into the other lines and sometimes it doesn't. You get a nice bit of accidental stuff that happens with this. And it's really fun to draw with this stuff. It's hard to get a line you don't like with a scratch pen. Um, a lot of people, if you read like graphic novels and comics, they like to ink this way too on top of color sort of stuff. It just gives a really nice line and it's very relaxing to sit there and scratch all day. And then if you go to the back cover, you see what I didn't draw. Um, the tent, I knew I didn't want to outline the whole tent because the tent was going to be lighter than the background. And I didn't want an outline around that for whatever reason, I just didn't want it. And so you only draw part of it. You draw the doorway and you draw the little stakes and the fire, but then the rest of it, I left blank and I could draw it. I could draw it with color later, which is what we're going to see. So the color bit, here's our color. Can you see that? Okay, Amy, is the color on there now? Yeah, no, it's great. And so this is our final cover laid out the way I would do it before it gets wrapped around the book. And so we go to our tent over here and we can see sort of what I was talking about, how there's no outline around the tent. It's just knocked out with color. It's just a lighter color, but there isn't that outline like there is everywhere else. I don't know why I do that sometimes. I just like leaving the color to do the job more than the outline sometimes. It makes it interesting for me. And so, but all of that ink work that you saw is now on top of this color that we did underneath it. I did the color mostly with markers actually this time. I have markers that are sort of nice and soft and they give sort of straight lines that you can see. Um, it's hard to get that with a brush. I'm not very good with a brush. And so I like to use markers or something I can hold that's a little bit more solid. Um, and so this was all done with markers. And then the, the letters I drew too, and we can kind of see, you know, you can move those around and we can even do, let me see if I can move this. Um, we can sort of, oh. oh, wait, it's all gonna go away for a second. There we go. Um, Oh. We can take away some of the color. <laughs> Most of these covers have a big yellow overlay on it. So there is the underneath cover. Underneath all of our covers is a, a bigger drawing. Um, and then on top of that, we do a yellow overlay to just sort of push it down. It, the, the covers don't look very yellow, but there actually is a big yellow color because if it was just white, it would look too harsh. White looks too white when you print it. And so you kind of want to push it back a little bit. But then you can see all the trees in the top underneath the lettering and everything. And you can kind of see even what a difference that that makes. And there's wow. there's different adjustments you can make to the drawings to make them darker or lighter. There's many, many things you can do to change your colors around. 
And even after you've drawn the markers and you've drawn the inks, you can change everything in a computer afterwards. Um, it's a very fun way to work because you can make all sorts of accidents on the paper and then bring them into the computer and fix them or change them or do whatever you want. And it's a great way to work because you get to be all messy at the beginning with all your inks and your markers and everything. And then you kind of collect all that mess and you can sort of move it around and change it, but keep it looking kind of messy in the final. So that's, that's the cover for Skunk and Badger. That's how that works. Oh, wow. No, that's so cool. <laughs> All right. And, and just, I'll just give you the, so if you want to see that right. little thing, you that just remove that goes. dust jacket, mm -hmm. jacket and then you can see it. All right. Which is really, yeah, that's really, that was really fun to see. I, I <laughs> didn't know about the dip pen at all. So yeah, cool. the dip pen, I like it a lot. And it's, um, I'm not super good with it. There's a lot of fixes I have to do. And some people are really good. You know, when you see old lettering on like letters or certificates or something like that, that was all done with a dip pen too. It's all fountain pens. Some people are beautiful with it and they can control their hand. I'm all shaky and I have to just sort of scratch away. And some, you know, people have different styles with it. But if you ever get a chance to use a dip pen, you should try it out. It's very fun. Oh, it does sound fun. People call them cool. a nib pen. You can buy them in art stores and stuff. They're easy to find. Oh, that's great. All right. What else would you like to hear? Anything? <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about, we can talk about like, do you have a, a section in here that you didn't think was going to get illustrated that turned out being illustrated or like a drawing that surprised you at all? Oh, all right. Well, you know, actually, one thing that I was su su surprised about was that you chose to do several of these illustrations in in interesting ways, um, mm. like this long. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's uh -huh. several of these, and I I just thought, oh, I think I think John wants to wants to do that like that long <laughs> I like I I don't I don't know but I I mean that was something I noticed these two this one too oh yeah and well lakes are big and wide right when you're standing at a lake it doesn't feel like a tall picture it feels like a wide picture um, ah yeah 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 and so you want to get you want to stretch out and books are so fun because when you're inside a book like on a cover you're dealing with a tall image mostly although I've squashed it down to a wide picture with this bar but when you open the book, you've got twice as much space as you would ordinarily. And it feels really fun to stretch out and get wide with it and, um, and show, like in that picture, uh, Badger's throwing something into the lake. And so to show both Badger throwing and the splash from the throwing, you, it, that would be hard to show in a tall picture. You'd have to sort of show Badger at the bottom and then maybe the lake at the top of the picture and show the splash. Whereas if you stretch out, it's very clear. You can sort of separate them and and uh, divide your action up and it's much easier that way. I was really glad oh. they, like, they wanted that. Oh, I'm really glad. I'm really glad you explained that because I just, I, I hadn't thought of it because I don't <laughs> exactly, you know, I don't visualize that way yeah. exactly. Because we, you know, when you're using your imagination, <laughs> you, happen. I mean, you can just stand at an edge of a lake and toss something in, like you right. can see how it would well, be. But if you, you think don't about it, anything. even like in terms of, it, like, if you were going to take a picture with your phone of someone throwing a rock into a lake, right? That that's probably an easier yeah. way to think about it for a kid or someone who doesn't draw very often either. Is that if I was going to take a picture of you drawing, throwing a rock into a lake, and my phone was up, not sideways and I wanted to get the splash and you throwing it, I'd have to get it just right. And yet everything has to fit in a tall picture. It'd be really hard. And you might be blocking the splash with your body, who knows? But if I turn it sideways and I say, throw it sideways, there's a much better chance I can get both the splash and you in the picture. And so you do the same thing with illustration. You say, well, should I turn the phone sideways or, or keep it upright? And you just try and think of what you want the picture to show. Sometimes if you want things to feel scary and tall, like for instance, we have that picture of the two cats and um, oh. it's a color oh, picture. Yeah. Or yeah, even the cave one. one. I just passed the cave one with, with Badger in a cave. So this one, Badger's in a cave. And it's kind of, it's not a scary moment, but it's kind of a scary moment. When you go into a cave, you feel sort of small in a cave. And the moment is supposed to feel that way. He's in a new place. He doesn't know. And so you make Badger small on the page and you put big things above him. A big, heavy shape is above him. Even just as a very quick, the first time you see that picture, you want that feeling to be the first thing you feel. Even if you don't really know what the story is, we can tell that Badger's feeling small and is kind of curious and maybe he's in danger a little bit. And so you can just think about that when you start the picture, you think, well, 
Okay, then that means a tall mm. picture. Badger's small at the bottom and there's a big thing on top of them. That's the very basic thing <laughs> of the drawing. And then you draw that and you can get very detailed, you know, with the, with the rocks and everything like that. But the main idea is that badger is small and the cave is big. So what's the best way to show that? And that's most of what illustration is. It isn't in the small little fine details. It's in big decisions. Like we want badger to feel scared here. And so what do we, what, how do we, if he was very big in the picture and he looked powerful, which badger can feel that way, it wouldn't suit the moment. He wants to feel scared in the cave. And so we have to choose the drawing to do that. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's take this one then. Right. This is the, so this is the opposite. These are scary mm -hmm. characters, mm -hmm. but you're still a tall photo yeah. or tall illustration. Sorry. The <laughs> idea here, I think if we had made those guys too big, first of all, there's sort of a, there's three of them. And so there's sort of a wide composition, right? If it was just meant to be one scary character, you can make them tall, but here there's three. And so they have to fit in a tall picture. And so that's about as, you know, they're pretty close to the edge as both those cats. And so that's about as wide as we can make them. But yeah. also they're supposed to be kind of big house cats, which I thought was really funny, right? Like we were, were reminded about how big everything actually is. These aren't people sized animals, these are small animals. And also they're coming out of dark trees. They're coming out of the shadows and they're almost part of the shadows. They darken back in, into the shadows. They're comfortable back yeah. in the shadows. They're, they're part of the shadowy feeling. And so, and they're the same colors almost. It takes you a minute to see that they're there. They're sort of cats when they hunt, they can sort of hide behind things and camouflage and you know, they can, you don't know that they're there. And so all of that felt like it fit. We weren't gonna make them feel as scary as we could if we sort of looked up at them and they were big, but I didn't want you to think that these were elephant sized cats either. We had to have the room to sort of realize what they actually were. And so you sort of balance it. You don't wanna make them feel too small, but at the same time, you wanna put a scary bunch of shadows behind them as if they yeah. just came out of there. Yeah, okay, okay. That makes sense. There's a lot of rules yeah. and then you break a lot of rules, I guess is, <laughs> is the feeling. Yeah, you know, I mean, it is really true that there's a lot of weird, I mean, even for me, there's a lot of weird animal realism in these, <laughs> in these animals wearing clothes. Mm -hmm. I, by the way, I've changed the genre of, um, I've, I, I now call this the animal and, uh, Wait, animals in sweaters genre is like what I'm calling it. I'm like, a, it's for your for your um, illustration of Eggers' right. spot. Because right. I, I, you know, I don't really like calling it the talking animal genre. I think hmm. animals in sweaters is kind of more loving because right. that's actually sort of how I feel about the whole thing. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so, but anyway, I guess what I was going to say was that there's a lot of realism in terms of animal sizes, animal, in some ways, in my head, you know, that well, there thinking. is, I mean, even on the cover of the first one, we talked about this, but if you look closely at the cover of the first one, Badger and Skunk are in the doorway, but look how big the doorway is. The door handle is above Badger's head. He's, when you, when a grown up is standing next to a door, the doorknob is by their arm, right? You reach down to turn the doorknob. But here, Badger would have had to almost jump to reach that doorknob. He's still animal sized in a bigger world. Um, and that was a decision. We don't, I don't think we talked about that very much, but to me, it made more sense for some reason. Um, and it's often how kids feel too. It's how I felt when I was a kid, nothing was built for me. I had to reach up to open a door or you have to reach up to reach something on the shelf or no, someone, someone has to get it for you. And there's some there's a there's a feeling to animals like that in people houses where they they would have to they can't get it. <laughs> Hi, you two. Hi. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, we are working on 35 questions from our audience. Wow, so guys. We're, gonna, we're gonna jump on in. Um, right. thanks for everyone who has submitted questions. There is a chance we're not gonna get to every question, so we're gonna try to get as far as we can. And if there are questions you really want answered, please go ahead and upvote them. So we're gonna go and get started here. Okay. Let's see. Our first question is from um Christian, a third grader at Bonnard. Uh, Barnard Elementary School, he asks, Amy Timberlake and John, did you need to research skunks and badgers before working on these books? Uh, uh, you wanna go? Yes, I have, I have an Audubon guide to mammals and I definitely look up every animal and I think about how big they are and how long they live and whatever I need to know. So yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> 
John, how about I do you? a little bit of research. I, I, um, I do sort of half and half. For my own books that have animals in them, I actually don't on purpose do research because I sort of like the idea that, you know, if I have a deer in my book, I said, well, I saw a deer on TV a few times. I might even seen one in the wild a few times. What do I remember about a deer? And your memory of a deer is actually really interesting. You've sort of taken things away from that memory or some things have blurred that you have to fill in. And so your drawing of a deer before you look up a deer to remember what he actually looks like is very interesting. It's like a weird dream of a deer. And I think that's a really cool drawing. And so, uh, but for Amy's thing, I could tell that she had done a lot of research and I didn't want to just put a dream skunk in there. And so you do look up a skunk a little bit, but also it's a skunk <laughs> wearing a jacket and it's a skunk standing up with a suitcase or something. So you have to change it a little bit. But if what, it, what usually happens is I'll draw it once without doing any research and then decide if it looks right. And if something's not right, if I can't figure out why his nose looks wrong, if it doesn't look like a skunk, just in a very simple way, if you're like, that doesn't look like a skunk to me, then you go and do research and find that, oh, that's right, they have noses like that. And you sort of change your first drawing. But I like doing a drawing first that doesn't have any research behind it to find out what I get. Great. Let's see. Um, we have a question from uh, Anisha, a third grader at Barnard Elementary School. She asked, John Clausen, how old were you when you started to draw for books? I was, well, um, for uh, to be paid for it, I was a little older. I think I was like maybe 30 years old. But, but uh, she's in third grade? Yes. That was the age I started drawing for stories is that we had to keep a journal in school and I drew, and we were supposed to write in the journal what we had for lunch and what we did on the bus and that kind of thing. Um, but instead I started writing a ghost story in the journal and I started doing drawings of ghosts in, and it was the first time I'd ever drawn a story. And I was so excited and I got so scared by the story that I had to put it away. I, I didn't know, I didn't want to keep going because I was so scared. But that was the first time I remember drawing a story and it's really fun. You should try it. So that's the perfect time. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. We have a question from Nina in third grade from Sheridan School. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's from, for a student named Ian. Ian wants to know, um, Amy, how long did it take for you to make the book? Uh, the first, I wrote two chapters first, and that probably took me about um, a couple months. And then the draft that I then, after the draft that I wrote after that took at least a year. So, um, I don't know, about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Okay, the next question is from Henry, a third grader at Barnard Elementary School. He asks, John, what is your favorite material to work with? Oh, um, I really like markers these days. We talked about markers earlier for the backgrounds and the colors of these books. And if you, um, most of my artwork has to get scanned into a computer. And so, I like to draw very small with markers so that everything gets very soft. And then you scan it into the computer or take a picture even with your phone. And then you blow that up so that all your weird little marker bits get really big. And I really like the look of that. So lately I've been using a lot of markers. Markers, great. Yeah. Everybody has those at home, hopefully. So can uh, you can, yeah, I like the Crayola ones best. I like huh. like the $4 set at, from Target or something like that. The cheaper the marker, the more fun because the more bits there are usually. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have a question from uh, AOB, a third grader at Barnard. And oh, this is a good question. Amy and John, what were your favorite books when you were in third grade? Oh, man. Amy, <laughs> Amy do you remember? Uh, not, not sure. Um, Nate the Great, maybe, was one. I mean, I love those. Those might have been younger. So, mm -hmm. but I read a lot of those. And I also read, there was this uh, landmark biography series that had like a biography of George Washington and a biography. I loved all those too. So <laughs> Are they those big picture books, like maybe Marie Curie was one of them too. Well, they were like, they were like this thick. They were about <laughs> this big. They were red, white, and blue. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember sort of what they look like, but. <laughs> John, how about you? Uh, my probably frog and toad was my favorite in third oh. grade. Although I had a weird reading time in third grade because I was living, I, well, I, was living, I had a room to myself for the first time. I have two brothers, but I got my own room in third grade. But because of that, my dad had to keep all of his books in my room. And so I would look at them when I went to sleep and I would look at the spines of the books. And one day I asked him about The Hobbit because that had an amazing spine. And I said, what is that? And so we started reading it and he would let me read some parts and I would read, you know, he would read some parts, but 
So I was reading Frog and Toad and probably Nate, Nate the Great and those kinds of ones too. The early readers were my favorite. But also I remember reading The Hobbit that year. It's a little bit grown up. So if you don't feel like reading it now, that's all right. But it's uh, that, that was the year we read The Hobbit. Yeah, those are great answers. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, this is a question from Noah, a third grader at Barnard. Um, the question is, Amy, when and how did you meet John? Have, have you, the two of you met in person yet? No. No. No, I mean, we've, we've, we've met virtually. This way, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't met in real life. It's been, we started these books before we could do that. And usually with a book, you don't, um, if you're an illustrator and author, often you don't even talk to each other. I think that Amy and I have had more contact than you normally do. Sometimes the books that you see, the authors and illustrators don't even talk at all. Um, and so these books came out and we finally got to talk. And we would have met by now, I think, if things had been more open. Um, yeah. But we've done a lot of these. And so we feel like we've met. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. Yeah, something to look forward to. Yeah. The next question is from Camilla, a third grader at Barnard. Um, Amy Timberlake, what were your hopes when you started writing books? Uh, um, hmm. I think I I think mostly I <laughs> that's a really hard question. You've like totally stumped me. I think I I mean there's so many there's so many different reasons that I write. I write because I don't know what I think. <laughs> so I write to figure out my thoughts. <laughs> and um I I write I I definitely hope that I'm communicating. Uh, in some way that I'm communicating something of how I experience the world that I live in. Um, with these books, Skunk and Badger, I really wanted to, I wanted to cast, <laughs> I wanted to sort of cast a vision for how I hoped, <laughs> in a way, I, all right, I wanted to tell a good story. Let me just say that, that is the number <laughs> one thing. But the world is sort of the world that I really hope we don't forget about <laughs> because there's a lot in this world that I love. And so you're seeing a lot of the things that I love about being alive and being in the world. I love bookstores and I love, I love that there are chickens that are different. And I love that, you know, I love that there are skunks and badgers and that skunks spray and that's annoying and it makes you feel alive when you smell them. <laughs> so I just, so that's the kind of thing that I'm hoping to do. And then I'm also just hoping that people read the stories and that they read them to each other and they try to make funny sounds. And I, I just, <laughs> I, I don't know. I often feel like there's a part of me that is like the bouncing ball in a room. If you put me into a room, I'm the bouncing ball and every, you know, and there'll be, and I'll just be the skunk kind of crazy person. <laughs> so, so anyway, so it's, I, I guess that's a long answer, but there's just so much. And I, I yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think because who I am, I almost can't communicate without writing it down first. I mean, speaking is not my first thing. My first thing is actually <laughs> writing. <laughs> Thanks for having us here on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I don't know what to do. I, you know, here I am, you fought me. <laughs> no, that was a great answer. And I think there's so many delicious details in this book that that, you know, people will start paying attention, like when they go outside in nature, like all of the rocks and the trees and the just everything in nature. It's it's such a, you know, the second one, especially it's just so special that way. So oh, job thank well you. Done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from uh, Nellie, a third grader at Barnard, uh, John Clausen. What do you what do you like to draw on your own? What do you draw for fun? I draw like really simple things these days, like very simple things. I actually try and remember sort of the things I used to try and draw when I was your age and I try and draw them again. Um, it's really weird. I don't know why I do that. Maybe, maybe we're all just really stressed out these days. We want to go back a little, but um, I like drawing very simple trees and very simple houses. I drew a pair of boots the other day for no reason, but they were just like, they look like upside down mittens. They were very simple. Mm -hmm. um, like very, when I like to sit down and draw for no reason, which isn't very often. When you have a job drawing, you, you're usually drawing for something else, that not your own thing. 
And so every now and then when I draw for myself, I find it's very, very simple, a house or a barn or a tree or, and just a shape, like not even that there's lines, it's just a shape. I'll show you a tree. Hold on. I'll show you a tree. I drew. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Actually, John, while you're doing that, another question, um, a Yoel from, oh no, sorry. Another student, I'm totally lost their name. Um, do you like writing or drawing better? Because you've done Me? both. Mm -hmm. mm. It depends hard. because yeah, writing is very hard for me. Uh, I've been drawing for a, a lot longer, I think, than I've been writing. And so I know how to, if someone tells me to draw like a truck, I can probably draw them a truck. But if they're like, describe a truck, describe a beautiful truck or something, I wouldn't know where to start. And so it's very hard. And so I have to work a lot harder. But if you do it right, then I feel very proud of myself. Whereas mm -hmm. if I draw a truck, I'm like, I knew I could draw that truck. And so, mm -hmm. but if I finish writing about a truck, then I'm like, wow, I, I did something. I feel very proud. So that it depends on what you, what you want out of the day. Um, yeah. Like here's my tree. Very simple. Oh, thing, right? yeah. and it's very relaxing to draw that. For some reason, I find it very relaxing. I drew a bowl. Here's my bowl. I just drew. I like to. I don't know why I draw this stuff, but I, I find them very. I just I collect them like pals. They're like my friends. I like them a lot. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, let's see. We have a question from Lev, um, a third grader at Fairhill, asks, "Why did the two of you decide to write a chapter book? Why why a chapter book?" Amy, uh, well, I. Yeah, I, I, um, I had wanted to try to write something like A.A. A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to try to, I didn't want to write Winnie the Pooh, but I wanted to write something that was that type of story in that style. And I wanted, um, and I wanted it to have my voice and my sense of humor. And so I wanted, to, I kind of, it was kind of a writing challenge. It actually was a writing challenge. That's, that is exactly how I thought of it. I thought of it as, oh, this will be, this will be a good thing to try to do. Just see what happens. You've never tried to do this sort of thing before. So it will be a good challenge. And that actually is a lot of how I approach my work. Every single book that I've written has had a specific challenge for myself because mm -hmm. it's just, it, uh, it stretches you. <laughs> so it's, you know, so you think I've, I haven't done that. I want to try that and let's just see what happens. I'm not thinking I'm going to succeed at all, but I want to try it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a good question from Fairhill third grade, Tammy at Fairhill um, third grade. They want to know, is it fun to make books? So did you have fun making this book, John? Yeah. I mean, it's very fun for me because Amy solves all the problems. I just have to make it <laughs> look kind of as pretty as I can. So my job is very fun with this um, because the book is already so great. I think the, what, what Amy talks about, about being sort of scared of doing it or not knowing if you're going to do it right, um, is very scary when you start a story or a project, like, am I gonna do it? Is it gonna be okay? Am I gonna do it badly? Mm -hmm. But my job on these kinds of books anyway, when I'm just illustrating, that's not the worry because I get Amy's book and I know it's great already. I just have to try and live up to that. And so I find it, yeah, it's very, very, it's a great, great job. And well, Amy, one of the funny, yeah. one of the funny things for me about that whole thing is, and I, John, I do, I do wanna say that I do not like think of exactly your, your, but okay, since John has been on this project, I, <laughs> it's really funny. I, I'm writing along. I am not thinking about, okay, here's what it is. I'm writing <laughs> along and I write this crazy scene. I'll write a crazy scene and I'll go, I have no idea what John is going to do with that. <laughs> and then I start laughing. Because I think, oh my gosh, I think he's stuck. I think right. he's stuck. But I know John in a certain way. Like I know John and I go, John will figure out a way out of this. But I have no idea how he's going to do it. And then I just start laughing. It's like this little he, 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 he. But I will do the I'm same like... thing. I'll be reading the book, especially <laughs> this one, the second one. I remember reading the book and thinking like, hey, me, how am I going to, you put, like, she just kept adding things to this crazy book. And I was like, I can't, I've never drawn that. What are you, how are you, it's like you're passing me some crazy note. Be like, go for it. See what you can, and I'm just like, well, all right, this just got much harder and harder and harder. Yeah. 
Um, but it was so fun. It was so fun. Good. I knew John would solve it. I knew John would solve it. I was like, he's going to solve it. And I'm not going to know. But I just thought, oh, my gosh, it's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge. Accept it. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth wants to know, and I don't know how much you can tell us about this. Um, why does skunk have such a big backpack on the cover? Mm. Amy? How much can we say about that? Well, okay. well, they, okay. Let me just say that badger and skunk have different packing styles when thinking <laughs> about camping. Mm. And if you read the book, you will find out. Well, all right, here's what I will say. I, you remember I read you that section from page 54 in the first book where, he, where Skunk says, picnic every day? If you are packing for a picnic every day, you are planning for a different camping trip than, you, than Badger is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see, a question from Aaron at, um, at uh, Barnard. John, what is your favorite painting? Do you have a favorite painting? And what kind of art do you like? I have a very favorite painting. I do have a favorite painting. Hmm. Um, it's called Hunters in the Snow. And if you look up that name, the, the name is kind of hard. The name of the painter is Bruegel. And it's kind of hard to spell. And people have actually spelled it a bunch of different ways. So just look up Hunter in, Hunters in the Snow painting, and you'll find it. And it's this big, wide picture of a village and people coming into the village in, in, in the snow, uh, walking in with trees, and they, they're bringing back the things that they've hunted. But it's just more of a painting of a big village with some mountains. And we had it in the house when I was growing up, and I would just stare at it. And I've only got to like it better. Um, that is my favorite painting. What was the second part of the question? Um, I think it's just oh. what kind of art do you like? Oh, yeah. I like a lot of different kinds of art. So it does. I think as you get a little older, you sort of, at first, when you're like, just starting out with your illustration or your drawing, you think I only like one kind of art and this is the only good kind and I'm not gonna look at anything else. And then you kind of get older and look at more stuff and you say, oh, well, that kind is okay too. Actually, I like a, a bit of that over there. And eventually you like most things, but at first you, you find, I just like this kind and then you start to branch out. And so I think I like most of it by now. Yeah. Keeping it so open very mind. old. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this next question is from Aku, a third grader at Barnard. Amy, how do you edit your writing? Do you have a certain way that you go about doing that? Um, I, I, I do absolutely anything that I think might work at the time. Literally, I mean, anything anybody has suggested to you, I have probably tried. Um, so I write a lot of drafts of every single book. So I write from beginning to end, and I actually keep to that order. Um, I do that several times. And then each chapter I revise several times. Um, and as I do that, I am, I'm writing, usually I'm the first, okay, so usually the first draft comes out short. Mm -hmm. The next draft, um, it's, it's almost as if I've run out of engine, like, the first chapter of every book for me is a, it's like a fire and the bigger I can build that first chapter, it, 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 um, it sort of propels you through the book. So the first time I write, I don't have a very big engine in that first chapter. And so I don't go very far and I go back and I work on that again, what the first chapter is. And then the next time I can go a little further and some, and then I work on each little part and I make it really long, and then I cut, 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 cut. And then I make it really long, cut, 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 take the best bits out, make that long, cut, 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 cut. And then eventually it starts to sing. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the way you describe that. I think that's good advice for people. It's not just, you know, one and done. You really have to work. You really, it's. it's and it's important too to remember, I think most grownups forget this too, is that like, you don't have to have an idea for a story when you start to write something. Mm -hmm. You just have to like writing. And if you start to write, that will come out. As you're writing, you're just thinking of things to write. But when Amy starts, she doesn't know the whole book. It's not just like she's coloring in the lines that are already there that she knows. She doesn't know how it's going to go when she starts yeah. writing. And you don't have to know when you start writing what you're going to write. You just have to start. If you think, I like skunks, I'm going to put a skunk in a car, what, what's the next thing there? And you can just make it up. It's all just making it up. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is really true. 
I have the first one of the first novels that I wrote, which was this one, That Girl Lucy Moon. It started, I'll show you, it's not much to, all right. Um, but that one started because I had a memory of sledding on a hill. Mm -hmm. And it was sledding at dusk when the light is exactly that. Um, I guess it's not Magritte. It's, uh, oh, there's like this really like crazy blue gold that happens right after the sun has hit below the horizon. And so we would sled and the hills are glowing because they're white and then that blue sky. And it was that moment and this whole novel came out of that. Mm. So there you go. Mm. Let's see, we have a question from Angel, uh, third grader at Fairhill. Um, why a skunk and a badger, Amy? Is there a particular reason? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to this question. <laughs> here, here are the things I know. I like black and white. Mm -hmm. I like stripes. Mm -hmm. Stripes are just happy. Mm -hmm. And um, so both of these animals have stripes. And then for me, uh, words and the sound of words are really fun and important. And the word skunk with the two Ks in it, it I, I, I know John and Heidi have heard me say this before, but <laughs> It sounds like somebody is stuffed up, like you have a cold, skunk. skunk. I mean, it's it's funny. And so I find it funny, it makes me chuckle. So there you have a good character. I also think it's, um, and then, I don't know, badger goes with that. It's more of a, a digging kind of word. It has, a, it has kind of a gray to it, but kind of a soft kind of chewiness or something. Mm. And then, um, I just think it was important that skunk, who is utterly, I just love skunk in, I just love skunk, but he's an utterly, utterly great animal, but he has this thing where he sprays. And I think it was important when he comes into the story, he's got this, in a way it's a flaw, but it's also who he is. And you have to accept the fact that he's a skunk. In, so he's a really good he's a really good animal character animal and sweater character because he's got a built-in flaw in I don't even know if it is a flaw I actually feel ambivalent about the spray but there you go <laughs> Great answer. thank you we have time for about two more so gosh there's so many questions so many good questions I really am sorry if we don't get to everybody's because they really are so good yeah thanks um, guys these are great yeah but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask this one because I'm also curious too and it kind of goes with another thing um so Winnie so John this is for you Winnie is asking what your favorite colors are and then there was another question um talking about you know why did you choose those particular colors for the book mm -hmm. so a little bit about that I, I, well, some people, when they draw, they use a lot of really rich color and deep color. And I go the other way where I'm kind of scared of color. Um, and so I, I, I think that I'm using a lot of color when I draw and then I give it to someone and they say, you didn't use any color here. And I, I thought I was very brave with my color. Um, but I like warm colors most of the time. I don't use a lot of blue um, or purple. And when I do use those colors, blue or purple, I sort of warm them up. If you look at the color wheel, it goes from warm to cool around the color wheel. And I like to stay in the warm section. Even if someone tells me to use blue, I'll use the blue towards the warmer part of the color wheel, just because I need it to, I want it to be nice and warm. And so the first book um, is very warm. It's all oranges and reds and things. Um, and that's just partly to make it uh, seem nice and sunny in this house. You, you want to make a book I'd like to make these books, especially felt like this already, into like a place you want to hang out. You want to feel like you're going to be comfortable there and you want to go back to that place. And the best way I can think of doing that is to make it look like it's nice and warm there. There's a good, strong sunlight coming in the door. There's that feeling of like an afternoon in your house where you're sitting by the window and there's sun hitting you and there's long shadows. And if we had done that with like blues or greens even, it would feel colder. It would feel like maybe a cold day. And so if you use warm colors, it's gonna feel like you can feel the, the warmth of it. Um, because we're outside in the other one, and it's more like fall, they're, you know, they're wearing sweaters and things. So it, you want it to feel a little colder. And so we got a little colder with, with the colors here. There's a bit of blue where the lake is. Um, there's some greens in the trees and stuff, but even the greens are sort of warm and the shadows are warm too. If you look on Badger's sort of shadow, that should, shadows are usually blue but I made them warm just so we could still feel like, you know, they're not uncomfortably cold outside or anything. 
And so my favorite colors are almost always browns and greens and, and sort of warmish colors that don't get too, too strong. As if color gets like really strong, I get scared of it. I feel like it's gonna print really strong and it's gonna look too weird. So I always push it back. So that answers that question. Great, thank you. Yeah. So we're gonna end on this question and um... <laughs> John and Amy have heard me ask this question before, but it's coming from a student, so it's okay for me to ask <laughs> again. So Salo wonders, this will be our last question, like I said, if you had to choose a character from the book, would it be, to be, would you be Badger or Skunk? Amy, what are you feeling today? Are you a bad, is it a Badger day or a Skunk day? <laughs> oh, I think, I think, um, I, I was thinking, I was thinking about this, Again, I mean, I am both of these characters because I, you know, they come out of me. But I think that I judge the skunk part of me more because I feel more comfortable, you know, just sort of, you know, I, I the badger part of me doesn't want to. I skunk is skunk is so out there in some ways, and I, but I like. I, I do have that part of me. And I, so right now I sort of aspire to be more skunk in all ways mm -hmm. and just let myself be that way. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Cause I, I mean, he's great. He's utterly great. So I, yeah. I like skunk. Yeah. Skunk the party. <laughs> yeah. Skunk is the party. Yeah. John, how about you? What kind of day are you having? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's close to the same answer where it's like you you sort of want to be more like Badger, who's kind of quiet and reserved and he's got his own thing. And so he, he just wants to be left alone to work. And there is that feeling a lot. But then I think that if you get into a room with other people or you go to like, especially these days when you're not used to it, and you would see a video, <laughs> if you see a video of yourself at a party and you think you want to be the Badger who's quiet and sort of smart and everything, but then you would see a video of yourself. You think I'm skunk in this room. I'm bouncing all over the place. Look at me. I can't shut up. And so I think that there's definitely, it's okay to feel like you have both of these in you because there are different days. Today, there's probably more of a badger day. I'm a little tired. It's been a long week, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's some skunk in there for sure too. Awesome. Well, thank you two so much. It is such a pleasure that I get to do this twice. In this <laughs> Yay! We're so happy to see you. We're so, so glad to be here. Yay! Wow. So thank wonderful. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for everyone who joined us today, all the amazing questions from all the kids and the grownups, thank, thank you. you so much. And uh, you can still, if you look in the chat box, you can see a link to buying the books. Please do that as soon as possible. And you have this amazing, again, amazing book plate. So yeah, and really, I hope the next time, for the next book, we get to do this in person. So that's yeah, it. Yay. Yeah. yeah.